We'll call the Capitola City Council regular meeting for Thursday, May 24th to order. May I have a roll call, please? <coughs> Council Member Harlan? Here. Council Member Bertrand? Shock. Here. Council Member Peterson? Here. Council Member Latour? Here. And Mayor Termini? Here. Will you please all rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This meeting is cablecast live on Charter Communications, Cable TV Channel 8, and Uverse Channel 99, and is rebroadcast. Saturday on Comcast Channel 25 and Charter 71. You may also see our meetings at our city's website, cityofcapitola.org. Our technician tonight is Lynn Dutton. Please turn off your cell phones. Please, um, when you make out the cards for tonight's meetings, just to give you uh, what our uh, form has become, the green cards will have one minute to speak and they get to speak first. Yellow cards, two minutes. Red cards, three minutes, they're the last to speak. Fill out the card completely, this way you don't have to waste time up in front. Filling out the clipboard, just drop your card in the box and you're done. We'll move on now to report on closed session. Nope, presentation. Oh, I'm sorry, I went right by my favorite people. <laughs> Forgive me. Presentation by the Capitola Safety Foundation. Um, our yearly report on the wonderful things the foundation does and for this, I believe our Madam Treasurer of the Capitola Safety Foundation will approach the podium. Hi there. Tell everybody who you are. My name is Lynn Banks, and I am one of the motley crew of the Capitola Public Safety and Community Service Foundation, which we call Capitola Foundation. And somebody is going to click through to um, help me with this particular report. This is our first annual report, but we've been around since 2005. This is our 13th year. We're a local nonprofit, all volunteer group of people who simply live in and love Capitola, love Santa Cruz County, and want to make it a better place. So we uh, sort of partner with the Capitola Police Department and various other organizations throughout Santa Cruz County. It is oriented towards problem solving, crime reduction initiatives, community outreach, and other educational efforts within the city and the surrounding areas. So our biggest baby is coming up on June 9th and 10th, the Capitola Rod and Custom Classic Car Show, which we call the Car Show. Um, and we have, this is our biggest fundraiser by far. This year we have two, 347 vehicles that have registered. And those monies and monies from sponsors are what help us give back to the community. This is a two day event. We closed down the village essentially to through traffic and park these lovely cars. It is fun, family friendly and free and all are welcome. The second fundraiser that we have is the Capitola Foundation Golf Tournament which has been held almost exclusively at Seascape. And this is held the first Friday in October, it will be on the 5th this year. And it's something that I encourage any duffer or expert to come out and enjoy. You are able to meet with a lot of the community members, the movers and shakers, and just people like me. And it's a really fun day. It's a shotgun start best ball. And you can get more information on it at capitolafoundation.org. It's another really worthwhile event as far as fundraising is concerned for us. So our work supports the PD and these other uh, entities, this O'Neill Sea Odyssey, Fallen Officer, the POA, Operation Serve, the Junior Guards. We have scholarship 
grants for the junior GARS for low income, and that's uh, been a huge success. Um, the Volunteers in Police Service and National Light Out are sort of under the umbrella of the police department, and we help out with those as well. Some of us are even volunteers in police services ourselves. So here's the O'Neill Sea Odyssey. It's a really wonderful, wonderful program that gives an onboard laboratory science experience to kids. And they have to earn the right to be able to have a trip on that. They have to do pr uh, projects within their classroom in order to be able to participate. Junior guards, you know, another remarkable thing. Uh, morning and afternoon sessions two different times in the summer and uh, there are people who have who were kids who went through this who are now lifeguards so it's wonderful and again national there's snapshots of the national night out we have bought and had trained several police dogs and there's a snapshot of the volunteers in police service as well Operation Surf. This is a remarkable, remarkable event where uh, troops that have been returning from Afghanistan, Iraq, and Iran have a first time opportunity just really straight out of the hospital to come down and have an ocean experience. It changes their lives so much for the better and we're very pleased this is one of the ones where we're very hands-on with as well we give financially but we also give hands-on support to the various uh, groups that we support uh, our sponsors that make it all possible paradise beach grill i can't say enough about Gary and Leslie Wetzel, they just, they're constantly, constantly asking what they can do. And Sam Linder it is wonderful also. He helps out with, or it's actually Stuart Kerr of Sam Linder, but they donate generously to the um, car show, as a matter of fact. And Netcinity this year was our premier sponsor for the golf tournament. We were very pleased to have Barry and his group. And these are another, you know, what can I say? You'll recognize a lot of them, and I hope that you keep them in mind when you're, when you need some electrical done or, you know, servicing, building, what have you. They're, these are the people who give back to the community through us and other organizations. And it's not just these. There's, I think, a couple other, one or two other slides as far as these are others that make it possible coming back again and again so anyway we happen to have tonight here some folks from operation surf so that we can present them with a great big check so if laura and kim can come up i'd appreciate it anybody else that's here from operation surf and anybody who's here in the audience from the foundation, if you can come and support us and them.
Lynn, don't go away yet. <laughs> Come on back. I, I just want to put you on the spot and tell you that I loved your presentation, and this organization for the last, what, 10 years has contributed thousands and thousands to backfill the needs of our police department. We've helped our officers go to trainings. We've helped in the canine corps. Mm -hmm. um, we've helped the armory. We, we've, we've helped in any way we possibly can and the police department appreciates it as do the other organizations and we were major um we become major donors to the library campaign as well as so thank you very much yes as a matter of fact this year our donations uh, as far as the ones that we're certain about uh, total over fifty thousand dollars <coughs> and you know in 13 years to come from sort of struggling to to make our presence known to be at this place where we can so generously support the community is really wonderful and yes very excited about the library project thank you thank you <coughs> are there any additions or deletions to the agenda now it's closed session Wait. what was that now it's closed session <laughs> report on closed session oh stop it now it's report on closed session but I think the city manager is the only one who can do that because we didn't have an attorney present. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, members of the council, the city council reviewed the items listed on the closed session agenda, uh, including meeting with their labor negotiator. Uh, they met with the labor, labor negotiator and took no reportable action. Thank you. Any additional materials? <laughs> Yes, we received seven items regarding item 10B. The most recent ones that um, arrived after distribution are available at your desk, and all um, additional materials are available in the packet at the back. Wonderful, thank you. We now go on to um, public comments. Um, are there any additions to the agenda? None. None. Public comments, These. this is the time when anyone from the public can come forward and address the council on items not on tonight's agenda. If you have an item that's not on tonight's agenda and you'd like to address the council, please step forward. Mayor Councilman, uh, Gary Richard Arnold. Um, I'm concerned about the erosion of self-government through regionalization. Uh, a lot of people have no idea that AMBAG is a layer of government over them that creates policies that are adopted here locally. Uh, the newspapers were bought out by the Bill Gates Foundation and turned over to some globalists. Uh, they're imitating the European Union in which the Hague uh, gets so involved in local affairs it, it goes down to the townships in England. Uh, the same thing is happening here. They have stakeholders at uh, AMBAG, uh, which are uh, very wealthy people that make policy. They don't vote on the policy, but the member from each of these uh, government entities, like the counties and cities in the tri-county area, are uh, pushed by them. Uh, the goal, the, the, there's been several attempts at regionalization. Ronald Reagan, when he was governor, uh, tried to do it by executive order. There came out a report after some study that it was much more economical and uh, efficient to just have the cities make agreements with each other rather than put this other layer of government. Uh, the uh, the county uh, community TV doesn't show up ever. The Santa Cruz Sentinel doesn't show up ever. People don't know their authority and the, uh, uh, our representatives aren't covered by that. We had an ex-person from uh, City Council of Santa Cruz and she complained that uh, a lot of people don't know this. With a charter city versus a general city, charter cities prevent a council person from going to a department and uh, having anything done. If they directly or indirectly influence any of those departments, the city manager will put you in jail for six months or have a thousand dollar fine. And when you're out there electing, we're in a campaign uh, session right now, people don't know that you can't do the things you're promising them. You have to go through a city manager that doesn't have to be a citizen, doesn't have to live in the area. Um, this setup of a city manager system was put together uh, at the University of Chicago, and it was funded by the Rockefellers and, and uh, uh, Alan Dulles, 
who said that it's, you know, they're going to be able to put international people into local communities. We have local cities and AMBAG already contracting with ICLEI, which is a front for the United Nations and the World Bank. Um, I encourage you to go have a executive mayor than that rather than playing mayor and doing the rotation of musical chairs, have an executive that's responsible instead of a city manager who earns their points by moving from one city to another. Uh, they're not interested locally for their career. Anyway, I uh, encourage you to uh, publish what goes on at AMBAG and consider uh, breaking your ties with them because these people don't know what they're paying for and the policies you're adopting. Thank you. Does anyone else like to address the council? Seeing none. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not moving fast enough. That's okay. My apologies. I'm moving fast. <laughs> Hi, Lori. Relatively easy act to follow. Um, I am Lori Hill, and I just would like to um, uh, congratulate uh, Council Member Ed on his Man of the Year from the Capitola Soquel Chamber of Commerce. Also, Teresa Green, a volunteer with the Begonia Festival, was honored as well this week. Um, I, I am here to um, say uh, thank you to the Council for all that was done on behalf of the Begonia Festival. And the Be Begonia Festival is honoring the tradition and the past um, through the contributions that are on your consent calendar tonight, uh, both for the, for the Historical Museum as well as for the Arts and Cultural Commission for some form of commemorative art in the village to honor 65 years of Begonia Festival. Uh, and honored to be a part of the team that uh, wanted to honor the traditions of the Begonia Festival. There's a new team that's honoring the traditions of the Begonia Festival, uh, Capitola Beach Festival. It's a great group of people. I hope you'll throw your support to them as well. And I just want to do a little shout out for um, at least further consideration of the Lighted Boat Parade. And what I'm thinking about is we spent a lot of time thinking about our history honoring our past, and something like a lighted boat parade that could involve LED lights, a little bit of robotics, would really encourage youth and technology and what is in our future. And maybe we can engage more of our young people in our community to get involved in such a wonderful community event. So I think that most of the items that could come up as a concern can be mitigated, but I'll let all the brighter minds think those things through. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lori. <coughs> Would anyone else like to address the council? If not, we'll move on to city council, city treasurer, and staff comments. Staff, any comments? Mr. City Manager? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I think we're going to hear from our public works director on the progress uh, of the work out on the beach right now. Great. Hi, Steve. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm happy to report that about 1 o'clock today, the closure of the lagoon took place. This is our annual creating the lagoon and uh, creating the beach. So we're uh, officially in lagoon mode with water going through the flume. Grading on the beach uh, will continue tomorrow. We'll take a break over Memorial Day weekend, have it in good shape, and then they'll do the final grading next week. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Madam City Clerk, anything for us? Comments? I have none. Okay, Ed? I have nothing. Kristen? Nothing tonight. Stephanie? Mm -hmm. Well, <sighs> here we go, because I've got a lot to say to you people. No, <laughs> not, not really. I just want to point out to our RTC representatives that um, you'll be hearing about the progressive rail contract, and that in spite of the fact that the RTC has pretty much given a deaf ear to our concerns about the safety of the trestle, they continue to um, be ready to sign a contract that will allow a rail carrier to, to go over our trestle. So bear that in mind when you hear about it this week at the meeting, that we have literally been ignored, as has the safety of our people been ignored. Do your best for us. Let's move on to boards, commissions, and committee appointments. We're considering an area agency on aging appointment. This is a council um, appointment, and we have one, uh, we have a point, both a representative and an alternate, and would you give us some background, Mr. City Manager? Uh, who is our our representative right currently? I am. Councilwoman Harlan is your representative now with the term expiring at the end of this m end of this month? June. End of June. June. So do we have an alternate? Not yet, but um, perhaps at the next meeting. We, we have to, we're gonna settle this tonight. 
because I have personally met with her. I know other council members have met with her and it's been dragging on for too long. So is the procedure going to be we appoint an alternate and can council member Harlan continue? Can she re-up her term at the end or does she become the alternate and our alternate become the rep? How does, I'm not sure about the mechanism. Um, the seniors council does not have a, um, any term limits or preferences. Um, for for this procedure, so we have both we have two people that are interested. Um, Councilmember Harlan has expressed an interest in continuing, um, as has um, Ms. Stedgard, and um, I know that uh, the new applicant is interested in either position. Um, we have not had a, a um, alternate for a number of um, I, I think almost two years at least mm -hmm. um, since before I was clerk. So. Um, it would be uh, helpful to have an alternate in place so we could at least appoint an alternate through the end of this term and then you can discuss um, positions through for the next term July through June of 2020. What's the council's desire? I'm happy to continue as the main representative because it's right. been pretty complicated lately and I want to make sure that whoever wants to be the alternate really understands the agency and the issues. Mm -hmm. But she's been to one meeting and I'd like to take her to another meeting and see whether she understands and really is going to buy into serving on this commission because well, it's a little bit complicated. Well, what do you think about getting motion. opponent? Yes, is there a motion on the floor? Motion to maintain Council Member Harlan as the representative and new applicant as the alternate. Second. For the discussion, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. One, uh, one uh, opposed, Council Member Harlan. I'm Four in favor, so we have an alternate now. And Council Member Harlan remains our primary representative. We'll move on to the consent calendar. Um, this is a group of items taken as a single vote. Is there anyone on the council or staff who would like to pull any of these items? Hearing none, anyone from the audience like to pull anything on consent? Do I have a motion to approve consent? Motion to approve consent. Is there a second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. We'll go on to general government public hearings. The first item on our agenda is food cupboard and the current zoning update. And I'm going to recuse myself because I live close oh, to oh, the project. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, let's give uh, Councilmember Harlan a chance to leave the room, and then we'll launch off. I forgot about the recusing. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Termini, and good evening, Council. Um, tonight, we're revisiting food cupboard. So earlier this year in March, we had a code enforcement complaint at 1973 42nd Avenue for a food cupboard that was placed in the front yard, um, almost out at the front property line. And there, people can drop off food and take food from the free food cupboard. Um, citizen concerns were um, regarding attracting outsiders to the neighborhood and recent vehicle break-ins. We brought this item to you on April 26th. During that meeting, staff brought up concerns for public health and safety and also brought up facts related to the zoning code in residential neighborhoods where these, this type of use is not allowed. The direction of the council was to come back and um, introduce where food cupboards could be allowed within the city of Capitola. So that is the focus of my presentation this evening. Um, so a food cupboard in the zoning code is considered a non-residential accessory use within an accessory structure. Um, being a non-residential accessory use, it is only allowed in commercial districts. It is also allowed as an accessory use to a food distribution, so such <coughs> as a grocery store. Um, the answer to the question would appear easy, but because right now we have two zoning codes out there, one that's applicable inside the coastal zone and one outside the coastal zone, there are different answers for each area. So, and again, it's only focused in the commercial zones. So inside the coastal zone, um, this is south on 41st Avenue, um, south, like near Jade Street from Capitola Road south. Um, Th they are u allowed as a, an accessory use to a primary commercial food distribution, so such as New Leaf that is in this area. Um, the location of one of these structures could be either inside the building or as an accessory use or outside the building within a small structure. The accessory structure would be limited to 80 square feet in size, 8 feet tall, and no electric or plumbing. 
outside the coastal zone. Um, again, it has to be located within a, the commercial, a commercial zone. They're allowed as an accessory use to a commercial food and distribution, so such as uh, Whole Foods. Um, but with outside the coastal zone, they're only allowed inside the building. And this is a result of when we were going through the zoning code update, many of the, um, is actually related to grocery stores having too many vendors outside, such as um, the Coca-Cola machines and newspapers and uh, multiple accessory uses on the outside of the building that were cluttering the sidewalks. So in an effort to clean that up, the new zoning code says all accessory uses must occur from inside the building. Um, so then we, aside from looking at the food cupboards, we took a larger scale look at a larger food pantry. So this would be a food pantry such as the, an establishment where a nonprofit um, distributes food to local residents. Such, uh, there's several churches in town that do this and also Bay Avenue Senior Center has a distribution. Um, so inside the coastal zone, a traditional food pantry is allowed um, within single family zoning district to multifamily. There's a, a, actually all of the zoning districts except for the central village and they could be utilized as an accessory. They could be um, brought into being as an accessory used to say a church or religious institution, lodges and clubs, um, public and quasi-public uses. And typically uh, the main use requires a conditional use permit and then this accessory use could be run from within that main use. And outside the coastal zone, this is the area where the new code um, is active. There's a more general term for the um, establishment such as a church and um, it's called community assembly and it's a place where uh, residents gather or nonprofits gather. And a traditional food pantry could be run out of a community assembly and that's allowed in all of the um, within residential zoning districts as well as commercial. So, and then I also included in the report what is happening locally in Capitola and this report was from September of 2017 put out by Second Harvest and it shows 12 of the uh, most active resources out there for food distribution to those in need. And in September of 2017, this report found that over 9,000 pounds of food were distributed to over 1,376 uh, residents. So there are great programs in place within Capitola. Not all of these locations are in Capitola, but the food that was given out was to Capitola residents. And um, with that, staff is recommending um, that the city council consider to continue to prohibit unsupervised food distribution in residential areas and continue with the code of allowing them within commercial areas. As uh, questions from the council? I have a question. Sure. Um, let me just step through this carefully. Mm -hmm. If this council wanted to allow food pantries, it would mean a change in our zoning code, correct? Food cupboards, yes. Food cupboards. Yes. Sorry. Um, and I've also been informed by staff that if that step were to be taken, that we do not have the resources to be able to police the safety, the, the um, wholesomeness and safety of food left in those pantries. True. If, if you were to allow the food pantries, um, we do not have any uh, resources for f monitoring food that's currently done by the county and we do not have those resources locally. And the food pantries and distribution that you have noted here do have that ongoing with the food they distribute, do they not? They would have to be in compliance with the county, yes. Okay, any other questions? Then I'll open this up to the public. Is there anyone who would like to speak to us concerning food pantries? If you do have a card, come on up. Welcome. Hi, Melanie. And I'm an ER nurse from Watsonville Community Hospital. And I'm opposed to the private cupboards because not a week goes by that we don't get a child in that has gotten ingested something somewhere. The worst case is a little six-year-old that I've gotten into Monterey County Sheriff's way too well over. We don't know where he got 
the edibles because it's a good family. The family all tested drug free, mm -hmm. but somewhere this kid got his hands on probably some tainted gummy bears. He may never wake up. And that's my big concern if we allow the cupboards out there. Some sick individual is going to throw in some little edibles thinking, oh, the kid's going to go, mmm. And I'm going to end up with this kid on a ventilator with the family. That's all I wanted to say. About Understood. Thank you. Very good point. Would anyone else like to address the council on this item? If not, I'll bring it back to the council. Jacques, you want to start? I'm totally for the uh, staff rep recommendation at this point. Anyone else have comments? No. Um, is, is there a motion? Yeah, I, I move to accept the staff's recommendation on this. I'll second that. And there's a second. Before we take the vote on this, let me say that I insisted this be brought in front of the council. I even asked for it to be brought back so it could be more clarified because I promised the people who are interested in it that I would bring it to light and we have a full discussion and a public meeting. Um, that doesn't always mean the outcome happens the way you like it, but it is the democratic process, and uh, that pretty much fulfills my promise. And we will now say all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you, and welcome uh, Councilor Harlan back into the room. Huh? She's here. Huh? She's here. Oh, I didn't see her. She's here. She's here. Welcome back, Stephanie. We'll move on to general government public hearing 10B. Staff. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, item before you is a continued discussion of the traffic calming options for Topaz Avenue in, in the Jewel Box. Just quick background, in February, after a series of public hearings, the Council directed staff to prepare a list of traffic calming measures that could be implemented in and around the Jewel Box neighborhood that would have less than significant impacts to the existing traffic patterns, basically ones that don't by themselves redirect traffic and um, uh, purposely direct cars onto other roads. Um, that created CEQA issues that we wanted to avoid um, and mitigating those would become difficult. <coughs> so went to the toolbox of traffic calming measures, selected a few, um, five that I thought would um, could be utilized in the neighborhood in various forms and locations. Those are speed tables, neighborhood or small traffic circles, curb extensions, signage, and movement restrictions. And I'll just run through those. So the speed table is this picture on the left here. It is essentially a raised um, platform that is flat across the top, similar to a speed bump, but it's flat and much longer than the speed bump. Um, they're often used, and I think it'd be my recommendation that they be used in conjunction with a crosswalk. Um, they're very good at slowing people down to probably the prescribed speed on that street of 25 to 30 miles an hour. The other one you could do is curb outs, which are probably this one, which is mid block. It's obviously just a narrowing of the lane, so people um, have to look forward and, and look for oncoming traffic. It, uh, um, narrows it down, usually down by a half a lane. So if you have a two lane road, you'd get a lane and a half. Um, if you do that at an intersection, it's considered a bulb out. And if you do it in the middle of a block, it's considered a choker. Um, those are two options we could look at. The other one would be a, a traffic circle. It's essentially a, a small roundabout. Um, here we have just Topaz and 47th, uh, a 12 foot uh, traffic circle in there. This is the turning rate. This is for most standard uh, passenger vehicles, trucks, and, and small SUVs um, could make it around with any problem. If we, you know, we haven't done an in depth analysis, we went this far. Certainly, we could just put a smaller one. I think Santa Cruz has uh, traffic circles that are as small as six feet in diameter. And all they're intended to do is 
you know, even though we have four-way stop at this intersection, is deflect uh, the traffic, slow them down, um, try and discourage them from driving through there without forcing them. Um, signage is the other option, uh, identifying it as a neighborhood, uh, residential neighborhood, and, and um, to slow down. These are all, um, you know, guide signs, I think is the proper term. That means there's really no enforcement involved with them, but they do ide help identify uh, residential neighborhoods and remind people to drive slowly in them. We've used these to, uh, successfully in the Riverview neighborhood. Restricted turning movements, um, this is something that I know the county used recently on uh, SoCal Avenue uh, where they restricted uh, right turns onto, I think it was Gross Road, um, to try and get people from cutting through there. Um, it's something we could look at both at 47th, um, where you come off of Jade Street and turn right onto Topaz, restrict that turning movement there. Just turn from the hours of the commute hours from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. And the same thing over here. Oh, I got the maps wrong. <laughs> At uh, Portola, where the, uh, after the, uh, they back up, and the traffic backs up going through the village, people tend to turn left onto 47th Avenue to cut through Topaz and up to 49th. So restricting those two traffic movements are examples of things that we could do. So, you know, here's how we could potentially, one layout of how you could use these elements through the dual box. Um, and I'll just run through it quickly. You know, we put speed tables on Jade Street. I think generally uh, adding some crosswalks across Jade Street is something we heard loud and clear um, in going through the public hearings that we've had uh, so far on this idea. So by combining the, by installing a speed table and getting crosswalks, we would both slow cars down to kind of deter them from driving down here and provide crosswalks. Maybe worth looking at also adding one on 42nd so people aren't cutting through here. This is a, a potential to become a, a, another cut through. Um, bulb outs along these corners, you could continue them up if you'd like uh, on all these streets coming off of 45th Avenue. Um, that would neck these down, make it less inviting for cars to turn in there, make you more likely to stick on 45th Avenue, which is where we want them. Um, the traffic circle, we show one here. Obviously, you know, there's other intersections that could be, sh could get them. Um, I think they would do a good job of both slowing people down, and if you slow them down, that's when they're going to try and find another faster route. And I already talked about the restricted turning movements. So... You know, I've had a lot of people ask me this last week, wh where do we want to go from here? So I've kind of tried to lay out some options um, that the council consider as we move forward. Um, we could continue to refine, kind of take the traffic calming plan or toolbox tools that I've identified and uh, develop them into more rigid plans that really identify where, the, where, the, where they would all go and um, the rules and then we could conduct another survey like we did. Um, we could do, I know there's been a call for conducting additional traffic monitoring. Uh, we could take new counts, we could take counts at more intersections than we've done or more streets than we've done and take intersection counts and really get a, a you know, we have a lot of anecdotal uh, information about where the traffic's coming from and where it's going and, and where the backups occur, but we could, um, take some more counts and really identify and map out the and model the traffic through there. Um, we could also do Bluetooth or license plate surveys and there they actually um, monitor the traffic and see where a car, where they enter into the model area and where they leave the model area and it kind of gives us an idea of how people are cutting through the, inter uh, through the neighborhood. Um, the other one would be if we do want to move forward with speed tables or speed bumps, I recommend that we uh, develop a, a policy. As I've mentioned before in other public hearings, um, this isn't the only place we've uh, maybe we we'll consider them. Um, I would anticipate that if we uh, start installing them in this neighborhood or other neighborhoods, uh, we're going to get a lot of requests for them. And so we should have a, a firm policy. Um, I know the city. The county of Santa Cruz has a, a good one, and so does the city of Watsonville, and we could look around. And that's something the Traffic and Parking Commission, I think, has expressed interest in working on if there's interest at the council. 
So my recommendations, real quick, sorry, is to provide direction to the staff on the traffic calling measures out order, um, outlined in this report. Are there options that the council wants us to, uh, for us to be uh, studying and direct staff to conduct a public workshop on these measures? I have a couple of questions for you, Steve. Uh -huh. um, what's, how do they do a Bluetooth survey? So Just it's a, a sensor that actually, if you have your cell phone on and it's on Bluetooth or your car is Bluetooth enabled, it just pings it as it goes by and it pings it when it goes out the other side. So it actually maps your route through there. And r right now, about 25 to 30% of vehicles um, driving down the road can get pinged this way and it allows us to mine. It doesn't identify information. Um, oh, I totally like trust you. Yeah. I, completely. <laughs> I don't see the data. How could that possibly? Right. Yeah. right. But that's, yeah. that's the way it works. And the license plate works the way they take a picture of the license plate and they look at the last three digits and, and go through. Yeah. So Thank you. it's a way of mapping traffic through these areas. Okay. Um, you didn't mention anything about something that's come up several times at the four-way stop at 47th. Is that something that the staff's considered and would it kick a CEQA? requirement in? I'd have to look at that. Um, I don't believe it would. Um, it should be a three-way stop. I don't think 47 goes through. Oh, that's right. Sorry, <laughs> three-way stop. Um, something we could look at. I'm not exactly convinced that would help m move traffic through the area and, can, and prevent cut through. I know it's been recommended, but it's something we could look at. Okay. Any other questions of staff? I have a question. Yes, Kristen. Uh, if we were going to put in the... Um, the traffic circles, would we be removing the stop signs or leaving the stop signs there and adding the traffic circle in addition to? I think we, and we could look at it. You can do it either way. My recommendation today um, certainly could be changed would be to leave the stop signs in there. Okay. Thank you. Question? Doc? I had a question about the traffic circle. Um, so will we lose parking, you know, because you were talking about the radiuses of turn so for safety, do you have to lose yeah, you parking? You would probably need to restrict the traffic, the uh, parking um, one space in on each corner. So yeah, it's potential to lose some, some small amount of parking at every intersection. Okay, so um, as you know, I think most of us here are for a community meeting on this to get the input from the neighborhood. Um, in terms of getting scenarios ready for a meeting like that, uh, how would you imagine that to work? Uh, how long would that take? and um, how would you go about it? So depending on the input we get tonight, um, I'd probably sit down and, and formalize some of these uh, inputs. Maybe we look at them individually and talk about them individually as we go through. It'd probably take me uh, three, three weeks, I would estimate, and maybe another week I th would like to engage uh, the traffic engineers worked on this previously uh, to kind of put this together and help me with the, uh, the workshop itself. So I'd probably looking at it three to four weeks before we'd be ready to have that workshop. And um, do you think it's feasible to have a series of meetings because after the first meeting, people get a better idea how it works and you might come up with some other ideas from that public meeting and then work those ideas into a second meeting? That's certainly a possibility, yeah, if, it, if that's what the council wants me to do. Um, but we've had that success with both the wharf and the, and the library workshop, so yeah, it's something we would be willing to do. Yeah, I've seen you conduct a number of meetings with that kind of scenario, one and then the next one. They seem to work out really well. Because the first time you look at some new ideas, it's hard to wrap your mind out of it, over it, and then you get some new ideas and work on from there. Thanks. Stephanie, any questions? Okay, we're going to open this up for the public now, so I will now call for the green cards, the one-minute speakers. Are there any one-minute speakers? Come on up, Neil. And there's another one right behind you. You're on. Mr. Mayor, uh, Council members and staff, good evening. My name is Neil Savage. I live on Opal Street. Thank you for the progress and presentation of traffic calming and reducing options, both from Kimley Horn and suggestions you provided from our neighbors. I particularly appreciate the recommendations for speed reduction on Jewel and 42nd Street and look forward to fr a further review and facilitated workshop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. Come on up. My name is Beverly, and I live on... Beverly, would you bring the microphone down a little bit, so... And I live on Emerald Street, and uh, the first meeting I came to, I said that I was really going to make an effort to personally not drive down those roads, and I 
I'm thankful that I've been able to successfully change my route, and I've continued to do that. And the last time I spoke, I suggested that we need to tell like the driving schools and the hotels to tell their patrons to not use these streets. And so I really think it's about education and uh, making a personal effort because we want to keep our neighbors happy. So thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you for those ideas. Okay, is there anyone with a yellow card, the two minute speakers? Okay, red card, three minute speakers, line up. And we're off. Welcome. So my name's Alan Cable. I'm one of those pesky Topaz people. <laughs> um, uh, Hold on, uh, Alan. Can I have time, please? That's what Charlie has. These are three. Hi. These are our three-minute people. So uh, first of all, thanks, Clear. thanks uh, to Steve Sorry. for for putting the suggestions together. Um, I have to say the the process that he's recommended feels a little bit like deja vu to me all over again, right? Because we, we have spent about two years with this process. We have had multiple meetings. We have had public meetings at the community center. And um, we really haven't <coughs> been very successful about getting anything done. So um, I have a suggestion on how we might move a little bit forward on this. And that is, you know, a number of the things that Steve has suggested are very practical and they're very simple to implement. So. I would say, why don't we try and just try and implement a few of these suggestions? Uh, signage, for example, I'm not suggesting we put traffic circles, and I don't think traffic circles are a good idea, by the way. As you can see, I'm British, and we have brought traffic circles to a, to a fine art in England, but <laughs> this is not a good place for a traffic circle, uh, and it's expensive. But some of the things that Steve has suggested are very practical and very inexpensive, and we could try them. We could have a trial for a period of time. If they don't work, if it doesn't solve the problem, if it pushes the problem somewhere else, let's try something else, right? Um, because I, I, I think that uh, it will be very difficult for us to go back through this whole process again and expect that we'll get a different result. Um, the second point I'd like to make is the, uh, that if we do go through this process, I would really ask that um, we have a different method of making a decision. I know Steve has asked for a consensus, but um, you know the problem with this with this traf this tree traffic exists on Jade, Topaz, and 49th primarily. There are other streets, I agree, but those are the three streets that get the brunt of it. They represent about 10% or less of the jewel box than the total population. So if there's some expectation that we're all gonna be sitting around singing Kumbaya over some decision, I think it's greatly, uh, I, I, think, I think it's a, a very optimistic decision. Um, so what I would suggest is if we do go through this process, I would ask the council to appoint an arbitrator, somebody independent, somebody who doesn't have any skin in this game, who can sit down, listen to these opinions, make a decision, and then come back to the council and have the council say, when this person comes back, we will listen to what they have to say and we will act on it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Can you clarify something, a question for me? You, there, you want to ask the speaker a question? A question, to clarify. When Alan, come on back. When, when, when you said signage now, did you mean the courtesy signage or are you including the no turn signage? Oh, I'm, I'm including the no turn signage. Yeah, signage. No entries, okay. uh, I think time no entries, time no turns right. uh, would, would you know, have the potential of of solving this problem. Now, I, I will agree that, that it's not easy to tell how these signs will implement traffic flow. It's I just want to be clear to if you were using all of them. I, I just wasn't sure if you just meant the courtesy. Oh, one. no, no. I mean, all I, it, it's all very nice putting, you know, th this is a neighborhood, please don't drive quickly, but, you know, we, 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 we know how effective right. that is. Hey, but, but, hey. But, but as you brought up the point, and I'm back here, right, I will, I will say that <laughs> it's not easy to predict what these signs will do, so let's try it. You know, one, one experiment is worth a thousand expert opinions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Sure. Welcome. Good, good evening. I was going to say good morning because it's the end of the week. Um, I'm Anna Morocco. I'm uh, here again and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the council. Um, I read the emails that uh, were sent to uh, Steve Jesberg and uh, regarding the traffic on 49th Street uh, onto Wharf Road and considering installation of a four-way stop sign on 49th, uh, on 47th onto Capitola Road, and I thought that those made a lot of sense. Um, but I have questions uh, with regard to CEQA. Um, 
from my uh, layperson's review of CEQA under class one uh, C, uh, subsection C9, it uh, refers to installation of replacement signs or new signs uh, and it's possible as long as it doesn't establish a higher speed limit along uh, a significant portion of the street and will not result in more than a negligible increase in the use of the street. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just wanted a little more um, definition of C1, how it applies to our situation. I was hoping to get that uh, at some point. Um, and I also wanted to remind the city council that when, when us Topaz residents came initially and went to the traffic commission um, and they made a recommendation to the council, uh, we wanted a solution that just dealt with Topaz Street. We didn't really want uh, to include the whole jewel box. And the backlash that we've um, since uh, endured um, and some of the insulting community comments that, that we've had to listen to, um, I think were brought on by uh, the decision to put these bollards, not barricades as they were referred to, but these bollards on all the subsequent jewel uh, streets. And um, I think what that would do is cut the jewel box in half. And so I think it was a little bit of uh, putting the cart before the horse and um, as Topaz resident, I think we just want to deal with what what we have going on on Topaz Street. And uh, I look forward to um, the meetings and coming up with uh, some of the options that Steve has presented. And I thank you for remaining diligent and pursuit of a solution. Thank you. Thanks. Next. and I leave, live on a 4725 Opal Street. Um, I'll just, I wrote a letter and so I'll just read that and then I'll hand that off. Um, dear City Council, thank you for, first of all, for directing city staff to reevaluate previously proposed traffic diversions in the jewel box. I appreciate that the focus now appears to be more about traffic calming, including signage, speed tables, chokers, bulb outs, um, not requiring the permanent diversion of traffic from one street to another. A, uh, in and around the jewel box area and also involving community workshops in the decision making, making process. Um, I reviewed the potential <coughs> traffic measures attachment to the city council agenda and I'd like to offer some of my thoughts. First, um, I'm wondering, question, if potential restricted turns into the jewel box will be applicable to jewel box residents. Um, if mm. so, Restricting traffic in and out of the jewel box during certain hours of the day, namely the no right and left turns from three to seven, will inhibit jewel box residents' ability to get home and also carpoolers' ability to drive off, drop off their riders. Additionally, restricting access will actively promote, actively move, sorry, traffic onto other neighboring streets. One example would be eastbound commuters um, on Portola would maybe jog over to Adrian, go down Opal Cliffs, come out at Portola, take a quick left and then a right down 47th um, because the current outline says it's no um, left onto 40, 47th. Secondly, I strongly advocate for measures that accommodate and even emphasize safe travel for bicyclists, skateboarders and pedestrians. According to the potential impacts listed in all the attachments for the suggestions, um, the use of chokers and bulb outs and circles narrow the travel way and visibility for these non-motorists. Um, although um, I'm not opposed to these options, my hope is that safe travel for the non-motorists will be prioritized um, as I am an active biker and there's a lot of um, foot traffic in the jewel box. Uh, thirdly, I believe the neighboring areas to the jewel box should be informed of the potential measures and are also given an opportunity to weigh in at the community meetings. Um, any me measure taken to calm or divert traffic out of the jewel box will affect the areas outside of the jewel box and the traffic has got to go somewhere. Um, and lastly, it is, um, is it possible to have costs of each, each proposed measure be available in 2018 dollars as opposed to the 2007 dollar estimates that were included in the attachments? Um, thank you again for continuing the traffic discussion, avoiding reference to it as a problem, and actively involving the community for um, ideas and input. Thank you. Anyone else like to address the council? If not, 
please don't don't lag for last word because I will cut it off. So if you're getting ready to speak, get up there. <laughs> Hello, young man. Yeah, John Nickel. Take your choice, Street 49th, Crystal or Emerald. I pretty much agree with most of what was presented tonight. I have concern about these traffic circles. My pickup truck has about a 26, 28 foot turning radius. I can't <coughs> even make turns in parking lots without backing up and working around. The, the example was, well, then you should go to the left. In other words, go into oncoming traffic and go on the left side of it. Well, I, I just don't have much confidence in those. But other than that, with tonight's presentation, I agree. I want to say something about the lady that got up here and talked about the local parking in the neighborhood by the hotels and motels. It is a problem. I get them staying there sometimes a week to two weeks on, on the sides of the property. The driving schools, don't they need to have business licenses to you know, have a business in Capitola? I mean, they just, that's where their business is. You know, that's where the driving course is for DMV. So the driving school is up there all the time, full time, doing wow. that stuff. So those are things to concern. Thank you. Thank you. I learned something every meeting. And we're all familiar with your driving. <laughs> Welcome, Mick. Hi, good evening, Council Member. Mick Ruth, Crystal Street. Uh, actually, I want to thank Steve for coming up with the ideas. I think they have a lot of merit. I think they'll probably do some good. I'd just like to make one suggestion, and that would be to add bulb outs to the remaining three jewel box streets at 45th and Capitola Road so those three streets don't look more inviting to cut through mm -hmm. without the bulb outs, just so there's some consistency. Sure. That's it. Thanks. Thanks, Mick. Welcome. Hello. I'm, I'm Carl Schubert, and I live on Topaz, very close to 47th Street. And I've been here before, and I've addressed you, and I appreciate the efforts you've taken. Um, we've been here for almost two years trying to find a solution to the high volume of cut-through traffic on that street. And we thought we went through the correct procedures, you know, we involved the police chief, we talked to public works, we were with the traffic and, and parking commission, we were with you, um, and we went through a process that we thought we would get a solution or get something that would reduce this problem that we see on our street. And, and we got to the point where there were facts, there was, there was factual information about the volume of traffic, you know, 1,100 to 1,300 cars down that street versus less than 100 on the next street over. Significant differences. And, and you as a council made a decision. Four of you voted yes for this. And then it was reversed a month later because of the severe backlash that comes from the community. And and what happened in that time was that it really tore apart this neighborhood. You know, what used to be, you know, the jewel box was a friendly neighborhood. Now I look at next door and I, and I see comments on there that attack and vilify us because we want a safer street. And, and this is something that you can affect. The way that you do business will either tear us apart or pull us together in the way that things are currently set up, passing this to public works and asking Steve to run a public workshop with a consensus is gonna be the exact same results that you saw in that survey. And it's gonna pit us exactly the way it did last time against each other. And what I need to ask you is how can you pull us together? What can you do to construct Steve's work in such a way that it doesn't do this to us. And you have to give them more guidelines. You can't just say it's a consensus <coughs> because if it's a consensus decision, you know exactly what it's gonna look like. It's gonna be just like the last one. It's gonna be just as bitter and the same <coughs> ranting is gonna go back and forth on next door and everything else. And if that's what you want, you're gonna get it. So don't let it happen. You know, there are some people that talked in here about it that, 
you know, that there are things that we might be able to do differently. And I believe that there does need to be some type of an arbitrator. And it might be one of you. It needs somebody empowered that can look at all of the information and say, in my role in government, I think this is the best thing to do. Thank you. So that's what I request of you. Thank, Thank you, you for your time. Next. Welcome. My name is Marcos Vescovi, happy to be back here with you guys. And uh, thanks, Steve, for the great job. And uh, I, I think that this is going in the right direction. We like what we saw. His uh, proposal is a, a good begin. Uh, just wanted to reiterate, like one thing that I keep hearing is about if we do something, you know, there is a huge problem with volume. And I keep hearing like, well, if we do anything, the car's gonna go, s the problem gonna go somewhere else. No, that's not true. The, the design that we're trying so that the cars may go to a street is more appropriate to have more cars. It's not that every single car is going to go into Opa or something like that. And that's his design is pointed towards that. Like how can we move and move at the right time so that we distribute better the traffic, right? We're not talking about moving the problem to the next street. The second point pretty uh, clear is we got a test, you know, you're gonna hear 100 people here, every single person gonna have a single, a different idea of how to do this, right? And I'm gonna waste a lot of time again. So the best, most important thing is to just test right now. And Detroit, we really ask you to think about the process. That's the most important thing, just repeating here. There's no way you're gonna find consensus. Not even maybe me and my wife, we, we think the same way. So not gonna find consensus, you know, vote not gonna work because it's like, this is a problem mostly on a few streets and not all of them. So that's the most thing we ask you to think about and thank you again. Thank you. Next. <coughs> Welcome. Hi, my name is Jim Donaldson. Uh, good evening, council, good evening, everyone. Hi. Um, let's see, I don't have three minutes prepared. Um, I do have a CPA license. Um, I love numbers and um, I do think that, uh, um, I like where this is headed with um, having further discussions. I think in order to facilitate those discussions, it would be really important to have good baseline data on traffic moving throughout various streets in the jewel box. I don't know if that's all streets. Ideally, it would be just different times of day, different days of the week, so that if there's ever a question about whether traffic has moved from one place to another, you could accurately measure it or at least have an attempt to measure it. Bluetooth sounds like an awesome idea, by the way. I think that would be great, too. Um, because in discussions I've had over the last, you know, several several months, um, a lot of times we don't know who's creating all the traffic. We don't know if it's locals. We think a lot, some people think it's a lot of locals, some people think it's cut through. It would be nice to have some data to support one way or the other who's, um, who, who's in all the cars and where they're going. Um, let's see. Um, I think the, uh, as the no turn signs, those seem, especially the one on um, Portola, seems like it could be pretty impactful. I just think that's another reason you should probably get the community to talk in the jewel box if their restriction is going to be, um, if their liberty is going to be restricted, as well as potentially people around. Um, just, I just, I think rushing to just go ahead and start posting uh, no access signs, um, it, it might, um, I, I would not be in favor of that. So thank you. Thank you. Ron, come on up. Hello, my name is Ron Burke. I thank you, I thank you, I thank you for doing something about this problem we've had for very many years. Much appreciated, and Steve's work in this. This is great effort, I really appreciate it. When I led a committee of seven back in 1999 to get a speed humps in the neighborhood, it was a lot of work, and I learned a lot in the process. We did realize, of course, putting those humps in place would not divert traffic, only would slow it down. What we also noted is that the fact that people on Topaz Street, where the problem is just starting off cut through, they would not be fixed by this per se. So I'm very supportive of what needs to be done, and I'm with Carl Schubert, like he said, the sooner the better we take actions, something needs to be done. We can belabor it infinitum. I think the proposal we have here in front of us is an excellent first start. But I would um, actually want to address a few things in a couple letters that were put in here. First, in Carl's letter about putting a no entry sign to Topaz particular intersection, I think it's a great idea, and I think it's a great idea for the whole community of Jewel Box as the in and out. And actually helps identify the community, maybe something to identify, here's who we are, we have an identity, we're not just a place you pass through. Uh, second thing, <coughs> in service of Matt Arthur's letter, I do sympathize with the fact he was nearly struck. I think for a lot of this neighborhood, especially who live on the avenues, this becomes a regular occurrence. 
Uh, I don't just want to take this one isolated instance in question, but to give you, for instance, on 47th Avenue, there was a house struck by a car that was speeding through the neighborhood on the corner of Jewel Street years ago. Similarly, across the street, there was a fence that was pushed over by a driver who was driving too fast and pushed over the apple tree. I've been struck myself by a passing vehicle on their side mirror. I can't tell you how many times coming out of my driveway because it's a narrow street. We've almost been at my, both my wife and I, and I'm the only ones in the neighborhood that feel that. I need to correct a few things though in Nels Westman's uh, letter. Nels is not part of our, our neighborhood, but I appreciate his wanting to, to weigh in on things. Uh, putting the installation of a four-way stop sign at 47th and Capitola Road, I don't think is an appropriate solution. It will help meter the traffic at the Capitola Road. It effectively make 47th Avenue more of an arterial, which we do not need. None of these avenues, 45th, 7th, and 9th are arterials. We do not want to encourage that. Similarly, we do not want to encourage the traffic to shift west towards 47th. We already get roughly, I think, about 2,600, 2,500 cars a day, which is enough for a neighborhood collector street. It is not an arterial street. And in regards to the three points that were made here about focusing on 47th Avenue, uh, he said it is a wide roadway. Actually, it is not. 47th Avenue proper to the property measures 40 feet wide. If you subtract the six feet for curb and gutter on each side of the street, giving you 12 feet, you have a remaining 28 feet of width of travel way. 45th Avenue is 60 feet wide, so you get the idea. Subtract 12 feet, that's 48 feet. 49th is 70 feet wide. So we don't want to take any more traffic than we need right now. It's hard enough the way it is. And it's not just the safety of pulling in and out and people driving close to you and you're walking by. The other issue is the fact of noise. If you understand the physics of noise, the way sound works, the closer you get, the much louder it gets. Thank you, Ron. Thank you much. Al, come on up. Take your time. Another one. Hey, Al's my, my senior. I take care of him. Well, I lived in the jewel box for 46 years, and this is our only second dispute we've had in the, our family in, in all those years. And the last one, uh, we ended up putting the speed bumps on 49th and the stop sign at uh, Topaz and 49th. The, this situation is, if you know, if the people in Topaz want speed bumps, you know, I don't really care, as long as what they do in their street. I think the important thing is for us for not to block any access on 47th. If we have a fire, police, earthquake, or Santa Rosa fire, that's our main access out of the jewel box. So when we talk about circles or barricades or or curving streets, I think that's not a wise decision. If they want to block within their street, that won't really affect the rest of us. So I would, I think that would be okay. Um, you know, sometimes we all got kids, right? A lot of us do. And sometimes in a family, the best answer is just no. So sometimes we, probably let this thing get way out of whack already. You know, it probably should have been slowed down long ago. So anyway, uh, that's how I see it. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Welcome. Uh, my name is Dave Aaron. I live at 4980 Garnet Street, so right at the corner, there, corner of Garnet and Lincoln. Uh, I want to thank the city council for um, its proposed solutions. I think there's some very good ideas in there. I wasn't going to talk tonight, but I'm, uh, when someone brought up the issue of uh, please make some action so we can try something out, I'm sort of a single issue voter, and I just wanted to at least put on the table that um, I would be against the uh, no left turn at 47th and Portola. That would put us during the four hours of peak traffic every time we come uh, uh, from the uh, uh, pleasure point where we have family would require us to go into the village and come around. It just, it's a, it's a significant impact. Um, the other thing I'd request, and I realize that this is a little bit of an optic because of uh, the size of where you're trying to uh, cover, but the whole jewel box triangle is left out of the discussion by this type of map. And I think you can't appreciate what that no left turn at, um, 47? 47th, yeah, 47th and Portola, unless you include the jewel box triangle in the map that's being shown. So I would request that optically the, it, the area be expanded to uh, cover all the neighborhoods that's actually impacted. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening. Good evening. I'm Cherry McDonald. I live in 47th and Jewel, right on the corner. Um, first of all, I want to thank the council and Steve for his hard work. I did participate in several of his meetings. And my second point is I'd like to ask where all of the people who are willing to participate and speak up now were two years ago when we first started this and a year ago when Steve was having his meetings and we did the um, survey monkey survey for the city and the postcards went out and the meetings we got very little response something like 16 percent and then um, the city council I feel like you were coerced into changing something you had already agreed upon voted upon and we suddenly had to change it so what I would like to know is can we do something that will give us better goodwill this time last time we felt like there were a few of us working on issues and nothing happened currently I sense a lot of rancor and divisiveness within the jewel box and that's unfortunate because a lot of misinformation has been given a lot of people are talking about their street versus other streets if you look at it logically as Steve has said they've got the same number of speed bumps or humps or whatever you want to call them got the same number of streets coming in the same number of stop signs so the traffic has to be viewed as a complete um, jewel box solution and the people who live within the jewel box should be weighted as a stronger opinion than those who live without outside that boundary of the greater jewel box area and for the people who've written letters and describing simple you know single instances I want to let them know that I'm sorry that those have happened to them I understand they're frightening and upsetting but those of us who live on the corners of 47th Street or some of the other heavily trafficked streets we get those incidents on a daily basis people you know I mean we had a bicyclist hit a car parked in our driveway the other night and I'm sure he'd been drinking but it scared me probably as much or more than it scared him and when I finally went out and he didn't need first aid didn't want me to call anyone he got up and was weaving down the street to someone else's so I'm really worried about the safety of the streets what I'd like to point out in conclusion is if you remove the emotion from it and the rancor that's come one of the things that we have sort of alluded to but not really um, looked at in depth is 49th Street 49th Street is 70 feet wide and already has existing sidewalks at least on some of the blocks on both sides of the street 47th Street is 30 feet more narrow 40 feet wide property line to property line that means that street is 75 percent wider and we should consider diverting some of the traffic that comes up 47th Street at enormous speeds well beyond what it's designed for and in ignoring the speed bumps almost using them as an obstacle course for enjoyment to a wider street now I realize there are pe influential people who have lived on that street and don't want their street to go through but thank you we have to think about it Rose come on up No, it's okay. We know who you are. We know where you live. <laughs> um, and Rose, let me let me ask you a favor before you begin. Comments and and address your comments only to the council because you were infamous for taking straw polls among the audience. Okay, I'm not going to do that tonight. I love I, you. Thank you very much. I wasn't actually going to even speak tonight, but I did want to first thank Steve for coming up with a lot of things for us to, to chew on. I, I take exception to the comment that we've been talking about this for two years. Certainly there are some people in the audience that have been talking to various departments and council about this issue for two years. The Greater Jewel Box has not been talking about it for two years. For many of us, January, February, um, was the first time we talked publicly about it after taking a survey that in my opinion was generally disregarded. I would like you to honor your promise to have a facilitated community meeting, at least one, two would be better, um, because I do think we need to sit down as a community, talk with a facilitated um, manager listen to everybody talk about what we mutually agree upon uh, iron out some of the things we don't agree on and come to a solution that pleases everyone so please 
honor your comments about a community meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Anyone else? Seeing none, we'll bring it out. You're making me an auctioneer again. <laughs> I didn't fill out a card, but I will. Um, my name's Judy Panic, and I've um, owned a house on Emerald Street since 1992. I'm in the middle block between 45th and 47th, 47th and 49th, sorry. And I just want to mention that um, the traffic in the jewel box is frightening. And uh, there's a, a dip at Emerald Street at 45th. And when people cut through from 45th, to 47th and continue on towards 49th. They bought them out on that dip on the corner. They bought them out and then they floor it. They floor it all the way past my house to John's house on the corner. And it's very scary. The whole the whole jewel box is very scary. So, um, and I agree. It's I I didn't hear about <coughs> any traffic calming measures in the jewel box until I got an online survey, which I took. And I haven't heard anything about that since, but I would really love to see um, really new ideas that incorporate, for instance, every other street being one way, you know, really chopping it up so that people, you know, people who cut off at 45th to come all the way down, for instance, my street, Emerald Street, you know, they can go one block and then they have to go another direction. So there's just, you know, there's a lot of things that we can do to calm it and to keep people safe. I was on 49th yesterday and some kids went by. I think they were going 50 miles an hour over, their sp over those speed bumps. So, um, you know, I, I appreciate that Topaz has a lot of problems, but I really think that we should always uh, as well um, consider the Jewel Box as a really special neighborhood and to be aware that we need to preserve the entire thing and keep it safe for us all. Thank you. And Wonderful. thank you for your work. Thank you. Going once, going twice. Public comments closed. I'm going to bring it back to the council. Stephanie, please start us off. <coughs> well, I'm really glad that we're we're kind of moving at a snail's pace, but that's kind of government sometimes for you, which is very frustrating at times. But I think we're getting there, and that's the main thing. And I think we're getting closer to all of you deciding on things you can live with. Um, I don't know what's going to work in your neighborhood. That's why I walk the neighborhood and ask the other council members to walk your neighborhood, to because you know what will work and you know what we can try to hopefully see if it works. So I welcome all of your suggestions. Tell your other neighbors and friends to give us any ideas, to support any of these measures that you like. Come to the workshops, and hopefully we'll work with everyone so that we can all go away in peace and nobody's going to feel that they got yelled at or they weren't heard, but that they, are, they're, they were respected. So I think we're going to have a good outcome from this. Jacques? So I heard, heard a couple of things that are very encouraging. Uh, first of all, thanks you for everyone to come here tonight. And as problems get more attention, more people talk about it, and it does spread a little bit. You know, for those who were first aware of it, like those on Topaz, it's been a long time. I totally understand that. And for people who are now becoming involved and realize that any solution on Topaz is going to affect the whole neighborhood, and as said multiple times, we have to look at the problem as a whole. So in trying to help out people on Topaz, we're also going to be helping others in the neighborhood. As mentioned many times, there's a lot of incidents, incidents that are due to uh, speeding and other things like that that are making the area somewhat dangerous and somewhat of concern to people who live there. And I think we heard that tonight. Um, one thing I really am very happy to hear is that there seems to be a lot of support for the ideas that Steve has put together. I really appreciate people that live in town giving support to our staff people and recognizing the work they do. And what he's come up with are ideas that I think a lot of you have thought of. A lot of you, when you think about them, say, hey, this might make some sense. But as Stephanie just said, we don't know what the actual solution is going to be in the end. Another thing that I heard a couple of times is calming not just here tonight, but the idea of just generally trying to calm traffic in the neighborhood. And some of the cases that have come up of people running into people, people trying to get out of driveways and stuff like that, it's gonna have impact there. So as the neighborhood gets calmed down in terms of traffic throughput, that probably will divert traffic, okay? And so it's gonna have a beneficial effect. So the other thing that um, I've been for for a long time, Rose just talked about a neighborhood meeting 
is something that we really do need. We need to hear other neighbors face to face talk about their concerns and what they think is gonna be the solution and why. So right here, we said, okay, traffic ball valves, traffic tables and stuff like, good idea. But we also need to know from a neighbor that's your neighbor, why they think that's a good idea. If we have a facilitator, it'll be a trained facilitator, and they'll have an idea of why that might work or why that idea might not work. So totally, a meeting, a neighborhood meeting, as I asked Steve, refine it over and we're gonna have another one, okay? So I think that's the scenario that I'm gonna support. So traffic calming, start with some ideas that Steve's, he's been working on traffic for a long time. So he's just, you know, we're relatively new to this. You know, we know about the stuff in our, in our neighborhood, but someone who's been working on it for a long time made a career out of it. I listen to that guy, so I totally support him. So traffic calming, neighborhood meetings, and I'm really very happy you are supporting the process. Thank you very much. Kristen. Yeah, um, I'm excited about these um, new options for traffic calming in the jewel box. I think that they're less intense, um, have less significant changes than what we had looked at before. Um, I think that considering the kind of concern and I, I've, I hear the concerns about divisiveness um, amongst the neighbors and I think that considering how that was before, this is kind of um, an example of when you know better, you do better. Um, and I think that the community meetings are a good idea. Um, I think it's really important to get further community input on these suggestions. I think they're fantastic suggestions. Um, and with that, I will actually make a motion that we authorize staff to proceed with a facilitated public workshop about these options. Second. We'll continue the discussion. Ed. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking on your amendment because if you go back to the staff recommendation, I think there were two items on there. One was to have the meetings and then include options from council people. So are you open to adding options of council people in that um, amendment? What, what do you mean options? It says provide, this was the recommendation, uh -huh. I think, which is, which is to direct staff to have a public workshop, which I'm yes. fine, but then in item one, it says provide direction of staff on calming measures and other options. Oh, I see, absolutely. And so if I yeah. can add another option to yours. Absolutely. That, okay, that's um, what and, what and if I could just add something before you begin, I think because of the laundry list of items we've seen, it would be probably more productive if council expresses options that they cannot live with. I just want to add one option. I'm go gonna ahead. Keep it simple. Well, I'll go ahead and talk, and then I just please. But did, did you get a second on that already? Did yes. You? Okay. Good. Second. I just part of that is that it said it allowed for options. Sure. So I just want to make sure the entire know. staff recommendation. Yes. Correct. Okay. Um, back to before before we vote on that, just want to go back. It was brought up a couple times that uh, the council reversed its decision. I just want to go back to that because people think that we were coerced or there was a problem. I, I tell you, I was the one that made the motion to reverse it and I was the one that made the motion to initiate it. And the reason I reversed it is because it became complicated, okay? So there were CEQA uh, documents that needed to be prepared. It wasn't about that I changed my mind, it become, became unrealistic. So the reason that I made the motion to take it away after the first time was not because I didn't want to follow through on it because I still believe that I said at that meeting, I said this is a real problem and real problems need real solutions. And a real solution means we have to take some kind of action. And I know that everybody's hopeful out there for some kind of new innovative action, but I don't know that that exists. Okay, you have people that want to get from point A to point B at the fastest time possible and they really don't care about your neighborhood or your dogs or your kids, they just want to get to where they want to go. Um, I want to applaud Beverly, who, uh, who has come twice to the meetings, and she said, you know, this is a personal thing. I live in the jewel box. I'm going to take a different route. And if every other member came up with that attitude, there, there would be impact because a lot of the traffic that's in that jewel box comes from cut through traffic, but a lot of it is self-actuated from people that live in the jewel box. And some people that came here said they don't want to be inconvenienced. I heard it tonight. They don't want to be inconvenienced one bit. I personally have driven through the jewel box, placed myself into traffics where I have to come down Capitola Road, which is an arterial, and Portola, and that's where we want the cars. The cars need to be on Portola and Capitola Road. They're gonna get down to Stockton Bridge to the bottleneck, and they're gonna work their way through the village and out to park and eventually back to Highway 1. But th the thing is, is you know, if, if you live in that section of the jewel box, let's say Garnet, and you know you want to go to Simpkins Swim to Center five times a day, and you, so your route of traffic is Topaz, then you're not being a good neighbor. You're saving time for yourself. 
So I took myself on Garnet and I went down, got into the traffic on Capitol Road, went down to the bridge and made a right during peak traffic and it took me about two and a half extra minutes to do that each day. I don't think that's a lot of time and that means if you're gonna run to Simpkin Swim Center five times a day, that's another 10 minutes you're inconvenienced. And when you think about if you're the person, if you're the sad person that happens to live on Topaz with a thousand cars, you're looking for some relief. Um, there is no solution that we're gonna come up with. There's no miracle. There's nothing that's gonna come up with that isn't gonna inconvenience you at least a little, okay? Whether it's a speed bump, whether it's a, a left turn, whether it's a bulb out, something that we do will have an impact on you. It isn't like we can just Bluetooth our way out of this. We can identify who's coming through there, but that's not gonna solve it. Um, I think what you really have to focus on, and this is where my concern is, is that is that the problem with the jewel box is that traffic is being is coming from the cut through and using the jewel box as the mechanism. So we have to, if we wanna, all these things we're talking about redirecting and turning traffic in the jewel box is just creating a maze. What needs to happen is we need to stop the cars from coming into the jewel box. Okay, and all these things we're talking about, whether it's you know speed tables and science and everything else, that's not gonna work because you need to keep the people on Capitola Road and Portola. They're coming in from Bromer to Jade. That's the access point. Okay, then they come down there, they either make a decision to go down Topaz, and this is not just whimsical, this is, and I'm not a traffic engineer, okay? It just, it's real simple, you just go park your car for two hours at, at uh, the community center and you watch the cars, and they come down and they either make the right onto Topaz or they make the left turn and go down 45th, 45th, thank you, and then they get back onto Capitol Road, they get to the intersection, they make a left turn, they go to Wharf. Anybody that lives in a jewel box that pays attention to it knows the routine, it's not rocket science. So if it was up to me, and I think I said this last time, I would put a concrete barricade at, at uh, Jade and Bromer and not let cars come in. <laughs> and that would solve the problem, okay? And, the, and, and I'm, I'm serious, because I, I mean, what I'm gonna ask is my one suggestion is I'm gonna ask under other council options that the city look into whether that would be a, something that requires CEQA, whether it be allowed by the Coastal Commission, if it's even a viable solution, because I still believe <laughs> that you're not gonna get, you know, real problems need real solutions, okay, and that's gonna do it. Is that gonna inconvenience people? Absolutely. Just imagine for a second that Jade Street is no longer, you can no longer turn off of 41st onto Jade Street. But as a resident, you have all kinds of ways to get to your home. But if you believe that there's a solution that's gonna exist here with the calming and everything else, I mean, the only way you're gonna keep cars off Topaz is if there's three foot dips every 10, ten feet and it becomes totally impassable. You have to tell that driver, make his experience miserable, otherwise he's gonna to continue to go down that street. And speed bumps, we all know speed bumps, okay? If, if, if I'm gonna vote for any speed bump, it better be one that spills a cup of coffee when you drive over it, okay? Because they will drive 30, 40 miles an hour over those speed bumps. It will have no impact on you. So I'm here sensitive to your problem. You have a real problem, okay? And it's not, and, and, and I can't you know, divert the problem to another street. That's not a solution either. I think our goal should be how to keep cars out of the entire jewel box. And that's why I like that recommendation. I'm done. Got it. Um, I think that the community meetings are a great idea and it's a kind of a done deal when I read the staff report. I think we need to make sure that we are addressing the greater jewel box. So taking the 42nd Avenue folks into consideration because they're often forgotten. Um, I, I assume part of the motion is, is just clarification, not an amendment, is the, um, the traffic table policy oh. because that is part, that was part of your presentation that we need to, if, Traffic tables are part of the solution. We need a policy from the city yeah. regarding how those get put in, who participates in the cost. And I wanna be very careful with that with regard to participating with the cost. I can see where it has to be a great, a vast majority of the people on the street that want them. But if we impose a greater cost on a street, then those streets with financial ability um, and disposable income will be more apt to be able to have speed bumps and that that speaks, it flies in the face of social justice. So we have to be really careful with that. Um, I don't want speed bumps to become part of the uh, the upper echelon of uh, income levels. 
I think that uh, I'm really concerned about the no left turns because it does have the unintended consequences of driving traffic into neighborhoods we aren't even considering. Um, I don't want to see that. And whatever we do in these community meetings and however we approach this, it has to be with consistency. Everybody in here has to agree from the numbers we've seen and even just sitting around watching it for a day, there's significantly more traffic on Topaz, whether it's 10 times more, seven times more, there's a lot of traffic on Topaz. We don't want to take that traffic and put it somewhere else, like another jewel box street, but we do want to get it out of there. Um, and Jacques wants to speak again, and as much as I don't want to spiral into the black hole of, of politicians talking, I will accede and give you a minute to give, you a, give us a thought. I got a yellow card. You got a, you have a, no, wait, you have a green card. <laughs> a green card, okay. yes. Yeah, reminds me of soccer, okay. Um, okay. Um, hey, you guys, you got the mayor of Topaz, I mean, excuse me, the mayor of the jewel box here, right? He <laughs> made mean, it work Mick, once. right? Yeah, that's okay, wrong. Okay. Yeah, yeah, wrong. He made it work once, you know? And I think, I really do, I'm saying this because it's my sense of the positive nature of everyone. I believe that once you start the meeting, despite everything you may feel right now, you'll start listening to each other and you'll come up with some good solutions. And that's a major thing. Um, talking to Neil many times, we need some data. So I would like to include on the motion that we include the Bluetooth survey. How, how should we work this? I well, let's, let's let the community meetings take place and let Public Works come back with us with the cost and the size of the Bluetooth survey. Okay. And I'm still uncomfortable with the whole Bluetooth thing. I just want to go on record. No, that's not, I mean, <laughs> yeah, right. but I like the idea for, for data. Yeah. yeah. I really think we need that. Just to clarify, the, there's two types of data we can collect. One is traffic counts, like we did on Topaz and Opal and the other streets, um, took snapshot photos. We could do that. We can include other intersections and just get volume counts, and that would be, that would be helpful. The Bluetooth is strictly a routing thing. Um, I would think the, uh, it, it doesn't do so much of the counting. It doesn't count every vehicle or anything mm -hmm. like that. So if we, you know, depending on how much we want to invest in this, mm -hmm. um, the, the traffic counts would be more helpful than the, than the Bluetooth, so. Okay, so but we'll, we'll hear back, back from, okay. from the community meetings on that. I think, uh, do we understand the motion and do you want it repeated? Yes, I want it repeated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the motion is to take the staff recommendation um, and continue the. Um, Can you put that sheet up? Oh, sorry. <laughs> right. Provide direction to staff on the traffic calming measures, and I think we have, and direct staff to conduct public workshops. And I have also included the, um, the speed bump policy, mm -hmm. which should the public meetings bring speed bumps to the fore, we need a policy to go <coughs> with it. We may as well get that on the books now. We can yeah. refer that to use the Traffic and Parking Commission to help prepare that policy. Oh, That's keep them stuff. busy. Go right ahead. <laughs> with Thank speed you. bump policy and I'm cost make sure of traffic. Well, the, the, the traffic table, the traffic table, um, table. policy yeah. Yeah, but and, also and everything you bring back from the community meetings will have a price tag attached to it so we can weigh this in the, in the light of the budget crisis we're going through. And the, my inclusion for the, uh, Closure of Jade and the CEQA option. Uh, and Ed, wa or Ed wants to know what happens if we build the wall on Jade. So uh, on that one, um, we'll do a cursory look at it and kind of come up with that analysis like we did before um, before we start including it in our discussions. Right. And, and by wall, that could also be one way coming out towards 41st. Right. That is basically a wall it's only on, on Jade. Side. It's only on one side. Right. Just okay. Uh, Stephanie. I think we might want to get some more traffic numbers for inclusion in the workshop because that might be uh, valuable information for the community members to have when they're discussing what options they might want to prefer. Well, so if we have a chance to get any more traffic numbers, you know, sometime during the workshops so they can see it, we can see it. Maybe the first workshop should use whatever we have and should you need more traffic, come back to us because we're very concerned right now about spending thousands of dollars at a time on anything. But I don't want to have these workshops um, and then get the traffic numbers and then, you know, we have to have another workshop. No, they, they we have to start about. with the first workshop. Yeah. If there's a need for more traffic studies, we'll bring it to us to spend the money and then go forward. Got it. Is that too complex? I'll figure something out. Um, 
facilitator? I. Is that that's not part that of it? there are facilitators I right have, there? I have an idea, so we'll work. And he has that. an idea. Then it's not part of the. But an arbit an arbitrator, did, I didn't feel any love for that one. We're the arbitrators. I'm sorry to say. So there's a motion. There's a second roll call vote, please. Councilmember Harlan. Aye. Councilmember Bertrand. Aye. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. Councilmember Botorf. Aye. And Mayor Tremini. Aye. Go forward. Thank you. A show of hands, who's going to send us nasty letters tonight? Emails? <laughs> <laughs> I can handle that with one cocktail. And no problem. The mayors. And, uh, the mayor, yeah. and uh, let's uh, adjourn the meeting. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Good old muted Zelda. <laughs>